2018. Uh, hopefully you're in the right room for the webinar today. Um, it's an expert series, so we have someone very special here today with us. Um, joining us is Robert Fish. Uh, he's actually a serial entrepreneur. Uh, one of his companies uh, is actually worth $1.5 billion uh, in valuation right now, Avid Exchange. Um, very interesting uh, individual entrepreneur, uh, certified uh, international coach for Gazelles, which is a leading premier organization uh, for strategic coaching to chief executive officers around the world. Um, it's very hard to get into Gazelles. I think a lot of you know Gazelles. If you've joined this webinar, um, you have to go for like a year or something like that um, through the program and you have to be pretty successful um, as an executive and an operator first. Uh, so um, this is uh, Robert's contact information. I urge you to write it down because there will be some giveaways and you may have more questions later. Um, Robert also uh, wrote a book uh, called The Breakaway Move. Um, he was also a contributor to Scaling Up, which is one of the top-selling books on, on strategy and execution. Um, and uh, another interesting fact about Robert, which I find to be totally intriguing, is that uh, he's actually a professional mountain biker. Um, the other day he told me he's uh, one of the oldest uh, pro mountain bikers in the uh, in the U.S., which is really cool because I compare that to me and I'm like, geez, uh, what, what can I say about myself? Uh, but with uh, no further ado, I'd like to first uh, start with Robert, and then Robert will hand it over to me later, uh, and I will continue after Robert's section, uh, and uh, so talk to you there. And Robert, please, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Orin, for the uh, <clears throat> for the nice uh, introduction. You know, I started five companies uh, since my first one in college back in 1994, and if I could think through sort of like the red thread of what's enabled me to create companies and scale and grow on a consistent basis. And my, my current company, Insight CXO, which is a business coach company focused on helping a mid-market scale and grow. It's probably been, I've been, been able to use the same kind of strategic thinking, strategic framework. And a lot of it, I have to give credit to Vern Harness and the book Scaling Up. Uh, like like Zorian said, it's been the, the top five strategy book on Amazon since it got published in uh, 2014. If you read the book, if you're familiar with the book, you know it's a, it's a dense book. It's like a textbook. Uh, so two years ago, I wrote a book called The Breakaway Move, which is kind of my uh, best way I could probably position it. It's like my, my, it's like my field guide for my CEOs and my senior teams to actually kind of build that strong core inside their company, really dig into what strategy is, how do you, how do you create strategy, how do you brainstorm around it, how do you facilitate those discussions with your team, how do you select what, what strategy to say no to, how do you select which ones we need to put time, energy, money into. And then how do you make it all stick? So, you know, there's, there's a ton of strategy definitions out on the web. Um, I looked this morning, I probably saw 100 just to kind of see what was out there. But this one I really like for the, uh, for the mid-market and, and, and larger companies. And it's, you know, your business strategy is, you know, what I call it your working game plan for achieving your long-term long -term vision. And I like the, I like the working game plan because, you know, your strategy should be something that's dynamic. It's not it's not static. You should be looking at it, you know, annually, quarterly, monthly, weekly, maybe even daily. You're always trying to find ways to do things uh, better, faster, cheaper. And I like to have all of my, my clients and their teams to literally on their, their one page plans is have the word draft on top of it at all times. So they're always thinking about how can we make this model better and how can we keep iterating our firm and not wait for the annual cycle to think about strategy. Should also uh, give you some guidelines and uh, on what organizational moves you should be executing on. You know, you know, it can be called winning moves. I like to call them breakaway moves. And what are you actually doing with your company to separate from the pack, create those blue oceans, you know, where you've got your great customers, paying for optimal profit, all those kind of things. Should help you set and uh, really prioritize your objectives for the quarters and for the year. Um, there should be clear line of sight of what you're doing today, this week, this quarter, this year, to like your three and you know, five, 10 year plans. At the end of the day, you know, reason we're doing this is for a financial results. So I think a great goal is that, you know, you, you know, you got your strategy right and you implement it the right way when you're actually exceeding the, uh, the norms for your industry for whatever net income is or, or cash flow. This is an example of a, a one page business plan from Gazelles. I think a lot of us are kind of not using the 1500 page, you know, 
business plans from a long time ago. We're trying to get these things down to one page plans. So we can actually see and digest these things. This is one from Gazelles. Um, there's other ones out there from EOS and lots of other uh, players out there. But I think Vern Harnish really made this one popular about uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And they're all pretty much laid out the same. This one's left to right. You might have some that are top down, like in, in A-Team software or other places. But you know, to kind of run through this real quick. So if you go starting left to right, columns one and two, or it's your core values, it's core purpose, it's your 10-year vision, your mission, BHAG, those kind of things. You know, people always ask us all the time, well, that's not really a strategy. I agree with that. So it, what it really is, it's a foundation for a strategy. It's a component for strategy. It's like what you got to do to kind of march your way to your 10-year your goals. So it's got a major place in strategy, but it's not strategy in and of itself. Column three is the three-year mark. And I think that's really where we get the hardest strategy. What are we... What are our three-year targets? What are our winning moves, breakaway moves, chess moves we're going to do to keep, you know, increasing our revenue, increasing profit? Column four is our annual goals and our annual objectives. Uh, that's really getting deeper into execution. And, and the far right of this plan, the last three columns is, is the quarterly plan. What, what are the quarterly plans for the company um, down to, you know, individual objectives and key results um, that we need to be driving for? And as I as I work with teams, what I see is the weak point on a plan like this, whether it's this plan or other plan that you might be using. There's a lot of weakness around the three year targets. And I think that's a huge opportunity that most of us have to really get a lot more clarity on where we're trying to go just beyond the one year. And the biggest benefit I see of that from the plan perspective is it gives a lot more clarity, and a lot more context on what we should be doing you know, this year and, and this quarter. This is another visual of really the same kind of thing. I like I like it because it gives folks a really clear line of sight of today through through 10 years. So I'll start on the far right on the 10 year side. If you ever read any of uh, Jim Collins work, Good to Great, he made the concept or the uh, phrase BHAG, the B, uh, Big Hairy Audacious Goal, very popular. You know, Jim Collins like, he likes using the 20 to 30 year horizon. What I find is most effective for most of us is the 10 year horizon is about as far out far out as we can possibly see. And part of that is, you know, what is your BHAG? What's your mission? What's your vision? Um, you know, you get your core values outlined, your core purpose, things like that. And then moving left, you've got the you got the three year, three year bucket here. This is when you get really a lot more crystal clear on what you're trying to achieve from a, like a strategic thinking, strategic uh, perspective. Uh, I like to call it the three HAG, the three year highly achievable goal. So you think about a BHAG, it's 10 years out, it's it's um it's a huge hairy goal right audacious goal um intellectually you believe you can do it but you can't actually reverse engineer it quite yet without doing a whole lot of work where a three year three hag is something that needs to be really really crystal crystal clear not only with you as a leader of your company but how can we create these three hags that we can share with the rest of the company so they can help us kind of roll on in the same direction then we flow down to our annual plans and our quarterly plans but i think you know my experience is as companies get more clear on what the three year is, it makes annual and quarterly planning a lot easier. Um, one thing I see people not doing enough of is, is building into their quarterly objectives and annual objectives, things they need to be doing right now to set up year two and year three. So what, what happens is a pattern that I see is companies do annual planning, they do quarterly planning, they do get into execution, things like that. They maybe they even hit their number for the year. And as they do annual planning for the next year, now they have to do a huge revenue percentage on a larger number and it gets harder and harder and harder. And at some point, the company tends to kind of flatline on revenue. And I think a, a core reason for that is there's not enough attention given to the three year mark and there's not enough thought given what should we be doing right now, this quarter and this year to make sure we have a great year two and a great year three. If you do that every quarter, every year, um, you'll always be doing things to iterate your company in a healthy way. And you won't have to kind of rethink strategy and rethink everything from scratch um, as you do your annual planning. Another visual I like to think of as, you know, as entrepreneurs, as business leaders, is that really kind of building pyramids. And if you really want to build a, a really strong company that's got you know, repeatable revenue, predictable revenue, we have to have these really strong foundations. And again, it's that BHAG, it's your core purpose, it's those kind of things, it's that foundational stuff that you got to have in there. Then as you move up the pyramid, it's three year. Keep going up the pyramid, it's one year. Down to the company quarterly objectives, 
and the very top of the pyramid, I think, is it's the individuals inside of our company who now have um, a lot of clarity on what they need to be doing inside of their individual roles, but also a lot of clarity on what they can be doing to move the company forward. So all of these big initiatives, these big strategies need to, need to have a mechanism to kind of filter in through the one year, through the quarterly, so they have some kind of individual plan so that we all can be rolling together to make these big initiatives uh, actually come true. Another big component about, I think, strategy is, and again, this is just my experience working with tons of companies, running 100 strategy sessions and five companies on my own, is, you know, what does it really take to make strategy work? And I think in the day, it's you really need a lot of discretionary effort from your team. And we maybe heard the story uh, about the bricklayer who's laying bricks every day, and back's hurting, he's complaining, and all, all they see is they're building the wall, and the next bricklayer is laying bricks and you know she's really happy about it she's excited because she knows she's building a cathedral and she knows why the cathedral is being built so we need to make sure we have those elements inside of our company so that people kind of know why they're doing what they're doing we're not just asking them to execute these big hairy strategies they actually understand why they're doing it and it actually is alignment with kind of what they already believe so we need to find mechanisms to get that discretionary effort into our company um, also i find when working with clients or in new companies and they, they're working on their strategy and all of a sudden they hit this kind of strategy wall, I like to call it. They get three or four or five ideas. They can't make, they can't commit. They're having trouble. Um, oftentimes what I see is there wasn't enough of a strong core definition inside the company. They're not really clear on the BHAG. They're not really clear on their purpose or why they're doing what they're doing. They're not really clear on the mission. So they have a really hard time evaluating what kind of thing should they be going after or what kind of things should they not be going after? And what happens is they'll circle back, they'll get the stuff dialed in, they'll look at the same plans they worked on before, and all of a sudden, that's usually what happens is half the ideas get marked off the whiteboard because they were not in alignment with their BHAG or their core purpose. And a lot of times I think when big initiatives fail, um, it's because they're not in alignment with those, those core values or core purpose. You can initiate a strategy and it might achieve the revenue goals, for a short period of time to get that, but long-term sustained growth, it really needs to be in line with, with, with the core of your business. This is a slide I've been using for actually three or four years now, and uh, actually since the last Olympics, and it's really cool uh, that Sean White actually won gold um, this week. And what the slide's really about, in my mind, is about mindset. So what I see so very often in working with teams is when they're doing their strategic planning and they're trying to come up with their annual plans and objectives, even down to the quarter, the team is coming to the table with a play not to lose mindset. And what they really need is a very strong play to win mindset. And the really the root cause of all this, and I what really want to share with everybody on the call today, on the webinar today, is that when you're working with your team and you're talking about strategy and you're really trying to get them to kind of be more intentional and more have more commitment to that three-year mark is most people are afraid to commit to things after the first year because they're afraid to be wrong. They're afraid that if I think we need to go after this sales strategy and I'm wrong, I might lose my job. Or if, or, you know, if, I, if I don't get the gross profit projection right, I might lose my job. So what we got to do as, a, as business leaders is create that safe space and create that, that play to win mindset where they can really dive deep, create a play to win strategy for that, that three to 10 year mark really the one to three to 10 year mark. And um, I think what you'll find is you'll have a much more robust strategy. And then what the team will do is they'll go back in and they'll try to find ways to minimize the risk. And so I look at teams that kind of come up with a play not to lose strategy in almost nine times out of 10, it's a riskier proposition than that they go with a play to win strategy and then go and try to find a way to minimize the risk on that side of it. So I think, you know, you know as you're doing strategy development, there's like this mechanical engineering piece of it. You can ask these questions. You can follow this framework. But don't but just keep in mind there's this, this um, spirit side, this mindset side that we all need to make sure that we're going after the right stuff. People are able to commit. They can think big. And you as a team want to make sure that you create this safe zone where as we start doing things to execute our strategy, you know, we all, and, and we all win and lose together. You're not going to call somebody out. Nobody's going to lose a job. They didn't get a uh, – a strategy just right or an idea just right and that's also why we call um you may have noticed it 
you know, on the three year, we don't call them goals. I call them targets. We're not looking for absolute precision. We're looking just, can we get close to what our target is on some of the things we're trying to project? And that also kind of creates that safety zone for folks to be able to go out and, you know, create these more aggressive plans. So you're thinking about your three year strategy, your three year game plan. Again, you want to come up with what I call the three hag, that, that really crystal clear vision that you have in your head. You can share with your senior team and they can be transferred down to the full company so everybody can help actually execute the plan versus just think and talk about it. Uh, your plan should include a few financial targets and the obvious ones are you know, revenue, maybe it's gross profit, net income, those kind of things. Um, a good game plan includes non-financial targets. Uh, it could be that if you've got you know, 20 locations now and you want to be at 100 locations in three years, basically measurable targets that the company can kind of follow. Next big component is what I call breakaway moves. These are your big strategic moves, uh, chess moves, so to speak. These are the things that you're going to do to attract more of the great clients, you know, eliminate competition, create this blue ocean, new revenue streams, all these kind of things. And uh, next component is, you know, thinking about in the three horizon, what kind of people and process improvements are we going to need to make? Do we have the right people in the right seat? Um, is, there, is there an empty role we need to fill to hit our three-year number? I think about, you know, some of the core processes. You probably have hundreds of thousands of processes inside your company, but there's probably really three to five I call that are core processes that are cross-functional that will, might actually break as you try to scale to that three-year number. So what, what should we be doing around process to make sure that we can scale and grow without, you know, harming the, the, the current business? And the last piece of it is, you know, what kind of new capabilities are we going to need to create to actually pull off our three-year plan? Maybe we need maybe we need bigger facilities. Maybe there's some uh, resources we need that we need to buy. Maybe it's a company we need to acquire. Maybe there's consultants we need to engage. But what kind of capabilities do we need to create and actually convert them to core competencies to keep scaling and, and growing our company? I think about it as strategy development. Um, you know, there's a lot of great methodologies out there. You've got Outthinker, Business Model Canvas, you know, you've got the five forces. And what I find is a lot of these big, complex strategy development platforms um, really get teams wrapped around the actual and around the complexity. They spend more time trying to sort out, figure out the, the process than actually having the deep discussions. And so I wrote my book, The Breakaway Move, and just talking to entrepreneurs and my own personal experience, I came up with 10 questions that I think are the the best questions you can ask to get the conversation started. We don't have time for all 10 today, but here are my, 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 uh, my top five. I'll share it with you. So the first question is, so imagine you just sold your company, you're flush with, you're flush with cash, you got no non-compete, and for whatever reason, your, your mission is to basically create a company that crushes your old company. So if, you, you know, if you're creating a company from scratch, what would it be? And this company was purposely designed to just crush your old company. But then now you had the benefit of you have all the inside knowledge about what works, what doesn't work. You know, what kind of clients would you go after? What kind of sales and marketing program would you put in place? What kind of people would you hire? What kind of business model would you do? And really what this does, it lets your team kind of just release themselves from all of the constraints they have in the current business. Um, not think about relationships and all those kind of things that prevent them from maybe thinking totally different. Asking this question gives them a chance to kind of create this new vision of the company. And I think what you'll find is there'll be a ton of stuff there that you could do to implement into your current company. And I've even seen instances where companies have actually started a whole other division or a whole other business around this new idea. So it's a, it's a really fun one to start with. Um, everybody has fun talking about it because it's very free. And it's, it's a really good kind of a, almost a mechanical way to get people in that um, play to win mindset. They don't really know that's what you're doing, but it's a great way to do it. Another great question is thinking about where your your existing industry bottlenecks are, but also think of it from your core customer, the kind of customer that you want more of. What are their bottlenecks? And what I think about is a lot of, you know, ourselves, but definitely a lot of our clients are what I call this normalized state of pain. They're doing things or buying things or dealing with stuff, but they don't really know there could possibly be a better solution. So think about your core customer. Think about all the jobs to get done around them. And then where could you actually go in and actually start addressing these bottlenecks, addressing these constraints, and trying to build a whole business, a whole offering, a whole product, a whole solution around that. 
that, that's, a, that's a great one to go through with your team. Next question is, um, is interesting. You know, there's, there's so much out there that we hear all the time about you got to be innovative, you got to disrupt, you got to do all these things to create value. And really, you know, if you're running a company and you're going 100 miles an hour already, it can be very kind of uh, stressful to think about that, trying to be a disruptor. Um, but what we don't think about is there's probably things we have in our companies right now today that if we could combine them, we could create something very unique. Um, it could be a product and it could be a service that you put together, you create some kind of new marketing wrapper, it addresses a core customer need, maybe addresses a bottleneck, and now it has something very unique to sell. And it kind of goes along with uh, Porter's definition of strategy is, you know, a unique and valuable position with a different set of activities. You know, a lot of ways you can do this. I call this my Reese cup example. I mean, somebody had the, uh, the genius to take chocolate and peanut butter, put those two things together in a unique wrapper in a, in a cup. Now it's the Reese cup, one of the, you know, top candy bars of, of all time. So think about that. What do, what do you have in your company right now? And how could you blend them in together? create a wrap or create something unique. Next question is um, something that I have used personally in every company and I try to find a way to leverage with every one of our clients and I've seen it work over and over and over again. And it's pretty amazing is, you know, who could you partner with who already has a trust relationship with one of your prospects? So I'll tell the Ab Exchange story. We started Ab Exchange back in the year 2000. We were um, online exchange. Our focus was commercial real estate. Basically, our core customer was if you were owned or managed more than a million square feet of real estate, that's who we wanted to, uh, to do business with. But you can imagine even back in 2000 before uh, software as a service model was popular and dealing with the commercial real estate vertical, um, they didn't move very fast. They didn't really understand what we did. They couldn't, they couldn't get our value prop. You know, the, the sales cycle was going to be very low. Long. So I went to a trade show and noticed that all of these, all of my core customers had these really robust um, accounting systems that handled all of their rent roll, all of their expenses, all those kind of things. And what we did was we actually went and partnered with the top three platforms in the industry and then got their sales reps to introduce us to their clients. So basically leveraged the trust relationship of the software vendors to introduce us to to their clients, which was our prospect. And we started getting deals done really fast. So it really took something that was going to take probably two or three years to build enough trust on our own to where they become would or become buyers that we started getting the stuff done in two to three months. And if you go forward to today, Avid Exchange is now in multiple verticals. They have over 120 different um software integrations and as they get into a new vertical or a new a new niche they they, they they use the same strategy what can we what can we integrate with and how can we leverage existing relationships to sell our stuff so we're not just trying to call somebody out of the blue and pitch our pitch our stuff we're going to try to go in through the back door through the side door and leverage some existing relationship and the last question i think is, is really powerful um, i think it's something that every company should be working on and thinking about all the time and it's you know it's, it's what are your brand promises and basically your brand promise is it's, it's your promise to the world it's, it's your promise to your prospects and the way I like to think about it is you know your brand promise is not just something that is a that comes out of the marketing department or sales department your, your brand promise is your promise to the world of how they interface with your brand and when you get a brand promise dialed in it gets a lot of clarity on what kind of products you should be developing, what kind of services you, you should be uh, developing. Um, it gives you a lot of insight on to how you, your, the entire company should be <clears throat> organized to pull off the brand promise. So it's not just about, you know, a marketing initiative. You know, what, what should sales be doing? What should marketing be doing? What should the, um, you know, your, if you're manufacturing, your, your product delivery service, what should they be doing? That's all in alignment with that brand promise. And, the way I like to really craft a brand promise is we want to craft it to basically think about creating a magnet where you're trying to attract more of your core customers. So we all have lots of customers and we probably have a handful of customers that we absolutely love. We would just love to find a way to get more of those. They say, please and thank you. They, um, you know, pay our the best margins. They buy all our stuff and we do great work. They refer us to somebody else. So what can we do with our brand? 
um, in full company alignment to attract more of those folks and maybe repel ones that don't. So think about brand promise. It's not for everybody. It's really something we want to kind of craft and create using our strategy to attract more core customers. The second piece of it is whatever it is, by, by definition, it needs to be really hard to do. And why it needs to be hard to do is we don't want some competitor coming in and all they have to do is just kind of tweak their marketing message and they, they, and they have the same brand position that we do. It needs to be something that they can't easily uh, replicate. And my favorite way to think about it is competition actually thinks we're crazy. They have no idea how we can pull off this, this brand promise. They have no idea how we can do it. And that's why the, the, the full company alignment is, is, is so important to get everybody on board with it. It's just not a marketing thing. It's about how can we organize the entire business around these, these two or three things that we're promising. Third element is it's got to be measurable. There's got to be some KPIs. There's got to be some goals. There's got to be a way to measure how we're doing along the way on our brand promise. But not only that, but our client needs to be able to measure how we're doing. You know, it doesn't need to be some kind of service level agreement buried page 40 of some kind of big document. It needs to be, you know, how they should be able to figure out very easily on their own if you're <clears throat> performing on your brand promise or not. If you get all that stuff in place, then you can do what um, Jim Collins calls the catalytic mechanism. And that's really how you get people off center to start buying a lot more stuff from you. And that's called the brand promise guarantee. You know, a lot of us already have guarantees on things, but the reality is they're just like me too guarantees. And what I'm really talking about is what could you guarantee that's like outrageous, over the top? Again, our, our, our prospects or I mean our, our clients or excuse me, our competition thinks we're crazy. What could you guarantee? Um, that would get our prospects to buy more from us sooner. And again, the way I think about all this <clears throat> is your brand promise guarantee is not for everybody in the world who write us a check. It's really designed for the core customer that we want more of. And the cool thing about brand promise guarantee, it's a great mechanism to attract more clients, but it's also a great way to get our, our these new clients to comply to how we want to do business with them. So they, they call us back on time. You know, they kind of follow into our process that we know if they follow this process, they're going to have an amazing result. So it's a great way to get a lot of control over your company, which something I hear a lot about is <clears throat> we're scaling and growing, but we're doing all these different things. We're kind of losing control of our, <clears throat> of our company. Brand Promise Guarantee is a, a great mechanism to you control that. This is probably one of my all-time favorite slides. And the reason I like it is it gives you kind of a, a, a vision of brand promise and strategy and, and, and how our clients and prospects interface our companies and then kind of what's underneath the waterline. So on top is what everybody sees is what we're really trying to do to build strategy so we can scale and grow our companies. But we all know that the real work is below the waterline. It's about our people systems, what kind of strategy rhythm we have in place. What kind of uh, platforms are we using for execution? How are we managing our cash, our core processes, our policies, the things we got to develop if we're going to scale and grow our companies? And you know, we need to make sure that we've got these um, objectives and measurable results that are above the waterline. That's why brand promise should be measurable. You know, the sales stuff should be measurable. And then, what are we doing below the waterline? What kind of objectives are we creating? What kind of results are we driving for? And how and how are we measuring all that stuff? And then kind of going back to that, that one page plan and to the uh, other image I shared with you earlier, as we go from the 10 year, we go to the three year, we get to the, the one year annual plan, but really the rubber hits the road at the quarterly level. This is, I call them 13 week sprints. That's kind of the race around me. I like, I like giving things race names, but you know, what are we doing to make sure the company itself is, is, is achieving the right objectives and we're doing the measurable things, but also what are we doing at the individual level? I mean, what, what are we doing to make sure each person is performing in their role, the way they're supposed to perform in their, in their current role? But also, what do they have clarity on what they can be doing to help the company achieve its quarterly goals, <clears throat> its annual goals, and also that, that, that big 10-year vision? Um, I've got a really cool tool I created in the book. It's called the Breakaway Move Evaluator. So the way it works is you, you come up with a bunch of ideas. The, and the next thing you got to do is you got to figure out which one should we spend time, energy, money on, and which one should we not. So um, if you like, you can shoot me an email. Email is right here. It's robert at insightcxo.com. Be happy to share that with you. I've also got a worksheet that's got the 10 brainstorming questions on it. I can send that to you as well. 
also it's a pretty pretty cool news um, I wrote the breakaway move book two years ago and about three hours ago got off the phone with my publisher this morning so I'm releasing a revision to the book it's gonna be out on Amazon next week really excited about it it's got some more examples in it some client you know client wins case studies in it so anybody on this uh, this webinar today if you shoot me an email and say Hey Robert, give me a copy of your book. I will mail you a copy of the uh, the new book uh, at no charge. So uh, that's my gift for you, uh, as far as um, you know, joining the uh, the webinar today. Zorian, Robert, thank you. That was great. And by the way, I I want your book too <laughs> with your autograph. I'll, you one. <laughs> I'll do it. I'll do fantastic. it. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, that's great. I hope that was uh, super helpful to you all. And um, so that was the strategy part. And of course, if you don't, if you just put the strategy just out there and you don't actually execute on it, um, well, then what was the point in the first place? So this, uh, this is sort of a segue to this next section about setting objectives, which is, you know, how you keep, um, keep moving towards uh, or, you, you know, keep moving with your strategy towards your vision that's 10 years out. Uh, of course, you can only do that. Um, one quarter at a time. You set clear objectives. Uh, you know, four quarters together, you piece it together to get to that first year and that 10 year journey uh, for getting um, from where you are today, which is your core mission, your core purpose, to your big, hairy, audacious goal, which is your vision 10 years from now. Where do you see yourself? And that's, you know, setting objectives one quarter at a time. And of course, when I say objectives, we're going to talk about OKRs, which is the most popular, most modern uh, goals uh, setting system out there that was actually, uh, I'll tell you a little bit of a history later, pioneered um, at Intel and then used by Google to become Google. That's, that's how Google, I guess, is, uh, is Google because they've actually used a, a system of management and execution and connecting um, their strategy to execution through these OKRs and uh, tell you all about it. But uh, when I say objectives, I don't, I don't mean just financial objectives. There are so many different objectives that every company needs to have in order to execute their strategy, right? But here's a statistic that 95% of your people, so there are a lot of CEOs right now on this webinar, 95% um, of, of your people don't actually know your strategy or clearly understand your objectives, nor their objectives own objectives, meaning that the employees at most of the companies and most of the employees at most of the companies don't actually know what their own objectives are, nor what the company's objectives are. Um, and this is actually a statistic from Professors Kaplan and Norton, who invented um, a tremendous amount of, of uh, valuable uh, research in strategy, and they, they invented the balanced scorecard, for example. I mean, these are globally renowned Harvard MBA professors. So um, they found this across many different companies and many different industries. So let's talk about setting objectives in a modern um, work environment, a modern organization. So OKRs. Of course, there are MBOs, management by objectives, uh, MBOs that Peter Drucker um, invented and talked about in, the, in his uh, – a book in the 50s, The Practice of Modern uh, Practice of Management. And uh, today, um, OKRs are probably the most popular system uh, because Google has used them. And there were over half a million views of, uh, of an hour and a half long video from Google. How the heck do you get half a million people uh, to view this video? And it's only been in the past few years. This video is only like three or four years old. So to get that many views, and these aren't from uh, consumers. This is from business executives and senior managers, right? That's that's the only cohort of people who are interested in learning about using objectives and key results methodology. It's amazing how much interest there is, and it's amazing how many companies we see today globally implementing OKR methodology. Uh, but here's an interesting thing. Um, if you look at OKRs, OKRs, the, they align everyone at your company and focus the collective effort on what really matters, right? So align, focus, uh, connected to what really matters so that your company can achieve the corporate goals and stellar results. The truth is, is that they're not really any different than MBOs. There are a couple of little things, but simply put, OKRs that are super famous today 
are really just plainly objectives. What OKRs really mean is go ahead and set some objectives and put some measurable key results you want to get out of them, right? Um, today, everyone, and when I say everyone, of course, you know, I don't mean like every single company in the world, but, but there are so many companies using OKRs today. I'll show you a short list. Um, they're transparent, clear, and accurate communication of your top goals, top priorities of your company. And secondly, they can create alignment and cross-functional alignment, meaning that you can actually truly get alignment from the CEO's objectives for the company all throughout your company. So whereas in historical uh, sort of MBO usage, typically it'd be just the manager telling their direct report, hey, you're going to do these objectives this year and this quarter, and that's it. Today, OKRs are all about making it very transparent so everybody sees what different departments and teams and people are working on, but also you can align them. You can create an objective for an individual and through a technology, um, you can, I mean, you can try to do it in Excel and PowerPoint, by the way, it's a pain in the back, but through a technology, you can very easily and visually, and I'll show you how that's done, <coughs> connect someone's objective, excuse me, <clears throat> up to their team objective or department objective from their own connected further to the top corporate objective. It's amazing. And everybody can see how their work and how their team's effort impacts what really matters for the organization. Really amazing. It's amazing when people can see that. And when they update their uh, progresses and their different objectives, those progresses can actually move the needle for the objectives to which they contribute, to which they align. So everything is actually working algorithmically in sync. And the company is moving forward like this big machine and wheels are turning. And every time that someone's making progress, it all trickles up, letters up. It's amazing. Um, it connects employees to what matters. It improves continuous learning. Where people uh, at the end of the quarter, uh, the difference, you know, one of the key differences between objective and just simply, you know, some some tasks, right, is that you get to actually score the progress of the objective at the end. Not actually, uh, when I say the progress, I don't mean update what, you know, whether you're at 30% or 50% or 70% of your uh, goal. No, no, no. That's something you do regularly anyway. I'm talking about grading and scoring uh, the outcome, you know, did you do well? Didn't you do well? What did you learn out of it? So you get to ruminate, you get to pause and think about it and learn from it, right? And since every organization is a learning machine, right? You're constantly trying to learn to improve. That's incredibly valuable. It's just inherently very valuable to improve the company. <clears throat> and basically, <clears throat> using OKRs, you establish measurable progress indicators, right? You make progress or you make work measurable. Most of the companies, unfortunately, who don't use objectives, uh, they're kind of flying by the seat of their pants, right? People are just doing activity, but not really necessarily achieving results. Those are two different things. The progress and the activity that they're doing, it's not measurable. They're just doing tasks, right? But when you use OKRs, you're putting measurability on your work. You're making your management team data-driven, and that's extremely powerful for every organization that wants to perform ex extremely well. These are some of the companies that use OKR goals. Pretty good list. Um, some more companies that use OKRs. Not too shabby, right? A lot of great companies globally use them. So let me give you a couple of quick pointers on, on sort of how, um, how OKRs are worded, right? Typically, the way to think about it, objective is a headline. What do we want what we want to accomplish? That's your objective. So for example, we want to grow our company globally. That objective, as you can see, is a title. It's a headline. I actually call it like a strategic theme, right? It's a strategic goal. But how the heck do you make it measurable, right? How do you put a how do you slap a number like a hundred million in sales or or for marketing in, in a business organization to generate uh, you know a thousand new leads? Well, that's where key results come into play. So the objective just announces as a headline, what is the big strategic thing you want to achieve, you know, this quarter or this year. But then you measure it with a set of key results. And the objective headlines those key results. Um, let me give you a quick idea of how alignment works, and then I'll give you a real example of an OKR. Um, and uh, by the way, you can go to our website, ateam.com, A-T-I-I-M.com. 
We have examples there. We've created a website for the world at large called okr-examples.com. Tons of great examples there. Um, here's a way, this is actually right from our product, just a sample screenshot how objectives get aligned. This looks like an org chart, but this is not an org chart. This is not about people. The, the, the zoom in lens here is not about the people at all. This is about objectives. It's all about, it's sort of like an org chart for objectives, right? It's very different. And interestingly enough, you don't have to be reporting. So the person at the very top, the top corporate objective here, grow our global businesses. Um, let's say this was a, a, a uh, manager of some uh, business unit or department. The objectives aligning to it don't necessarily have to be in that person's hierarchy in the organization because you can have cross-functional alignment. This way you get rid of silos. That's really cool, right? So this is not an org chart that's hierarchical. It's just objectives and alignment and contributions. So anytime you can have an objective here that um, that makes progress, let's say it's in the yellow and these few are in the red, uh, when they move forward, when the when, when you, you when you carry the ball forward, all the all the contributions that they're uh, making into, like the the card here at the top of this objective, its progress is going to move forward. Right, so it's actually mathematically interconnected very tightly, right? And then uh, another example, uh, so someone uh, asked for this webinar to give a very specific sort of, um, you know, OKR example and show how you can align. So I showed you one way to align is through different objectives aligning to other objectives. And then in the OKR methodology, what we also allow you to do is if you have an objective, let's say your CEO, um, grow worldwide sales right? <clears throat> well, the key result, like achieve sales of 100 million, that can be owned uh, by the vice president of sales. So you can just assign that key result to the sales VP, and the sales VP can then convert that key result, for example, in our system, into their own objective, and then further break it down and cascade it down to the directors, you know, of West, Central, and East, for example, uh, or get some other alignments going there. But you can take objectives, cascade them, or you can take an objective and then give the key results that are measurable that have no further cascading and just keep it that way, and the sales VP will just update it. So there are different ways to create the alignment through objectives and sub-objectives or through key results being owned uh, by someone else. It's really great stuff. Everybody knows exactly what they're responsible for. It's visual. And the whole company can see, they can feel it, uh, they can feel the heartbeat of the company and how everything is interconnected. Let me talk to you about Andy Grove, who basically is, is uh, credited as being the inventor of OKRs. But the truth is, if you read Andy Grove's book, High Output Management, he didn't even use the term OKR. Uh, he actually called them Intel MBOs. Uh, he took uh, Peter Drucker's MBOs and said they should be transparent. They should be aligned across the entire company. Um, <clears throat> he created the structure of O being the headline and the key results being measurable. Uh, unlike MBOs, which is like all in one, you know, the MBO doesn't doesn't have a headline and, and, and underneath it key result. It was simply one thing is like, you know, grow our sales globally to 100 million. So um, he said, look, we must realize and act on the realization that if we try to focus on everything, we focus on nothing. So he was trying to say that just take a few uh, well-chosen objectives, right? And objectives should not be about absolutely everything you do. They're not tasks, right? Objectives are outcomes, right? They are something that you want to achieve at the end. That's the end goal. That's the result you want. And they should be measurable. Um, and of course, I, you know, we spend, a, you know, we have a lot of content about how to make sure you're not wording your objectives as if they're just tasks, etc. Uh, but the point is here that when you choose your OKRs, Andy Grove said, just choose select few things that truly matter. It's just like your strategy. Um, you could be, you know, all things to all people, but you really truly uh, focus on what's core and really important and then get rid of everything else. Um, the three keys to success with setting objectives at your company and especially using OKRs is first of all, discretion. Uh, second of all, common sense. Uh, and common sense is not so common. So really focus on ensuring that you're applying a lot of common sense and so is your team. 
and then walk before you run because we see a lot of customers. We have thousands of them globally, and a lot of folks try to, um, you know, try to make it perfect in the first quarter that they start using objectives and OKRs and getting alignment. They want the alignment to be just perfect. They want everybody to word their OKRs just perfectly. Don't do that. Done is better than perfect, right? Walk before you run. It's far better that you start using objectives uh, or like a system like OKR then you don't at all because you'll be flying by the seat of your pants if you're not really setting objectives and managing people's progress measurably. So if you just get started, even if you feel like it's a little bit imperfect and some of the wording is imperfect and the objective, um, you have maybe uh, too many objectives, usually the ideal is you know anywhere between uh, one to five and the average is like three per category, three key, you know top objectives per company three per department, three per team, um, but you can have five, but if you have 10 or 12, that's too much. But you know what I, I sometimes tell uh, some of our customers, that's okay. You'll find a way to prune it, right? And bring it down to five. You'll realize what are the truly core ones once you start updating them on a regular basis. So walk before you run, don't try to make it perfect. Uh, the other thing that Andy Grove said is the keys to set them and check in on them frequently. And when I say check in on them frequently, you you want to have annual OKRs and you want to have quarterly OKRs. And each quarter has about, what, 13 weeks? Let's call it 12 just to make it simple, right? Uh, three months, you know, roughly four plus weeks per month. And, uh, you know, our recommendation is to spend five minutes per week to update your objectives. You're only going to have three objectives, right? Maybe five, right? I said you can have anywhere between one and five. Why wouldn't you take just five minutes and update them, right? You're, you know, let's say your first objective is, um, and the key result on on the objective is, you know, you got to print, you know, or or create ten widgets, and and this week you created, um, you know, two widgets. <clears throat> Why don't you update that? It takes a, you know, just a few minutes to update all of that, and then every week, you've taken a bare minimum amount of time to see where you stand. The whole organization is updated on where things really are, measurably. You have dashboards and data to see it. And that makes uh, that gives you a ton of time to course correct if you're finding yourself behind the timeline where you should be, right? So if you're supposed to be, you know, and, and by the way, you know, just to give you a quick idea, like even in our product, you have the percentages and the gauges to see where you are versus where you should be. You have the yellow, red, like in the red, you're in the be you're really at risk. Yellow, you're behind. You're you're you know on track with a couple of them, and you know in real time where you are versus where you should be. So update things frequently. It takes just a few minutes, but it has a hugely valuable impact on your organization. Reduces the cost of finding yourself too far behind when you're like in week ten of the quarter. Right. So that's really key. Um, a lot of our clients do uh, have teams update them weekly for a couple of minutes. Um, some other ones have it like every two weeks. Uh, but this uh, this over here shows you there's a Deloitte research that the more frequently uh, your uh, goals are set and, and updated. Right. Organizations that revise or review goals, um, they say quarterly. Right. Or more. And by the way, this is from uh, the research that says don't do it once a year because a lot of organizations just set once a year goal. Um, you know, if you do it quarterly, you're 3.5 times more likely to be in the top quartile of your business performance. Well, if you do it weekly, and by the way, again, a few minutes a week, you'll probably be like in the 10x more likely to be in the top quartile of your business, right? Because that means uh, for every week, everybody really knows what's going on. A few more pointers. Start every meeting with goals. Why aren't meetings started with, hey, here are our objectives for our team or for our business unit. Let's discuss where we are versus where we should be. Let's discuss, you know, how is the progress of the goals? Uh, how about every meeting with a direct report? Why is not every single manager having a one-on-one -on -one meeting every week for like 30 to 45 minutes and starts with objectives, not just like some general talk about activity, but literally, like, where are we versus where we should be? Are we on track? Anything good and anything bad, right? Or identify problem areas early, right? Look at what's in the red versus what's in the yellow or green. Where are you stuck? What are the bottlenecks? Where can I help you as your department head 
or your or your direct manager to help you move the ball forward what's at risk right now in terms of the objectives that you need to hit right stop the conversations about tech uh, tasks and activity let's focus on the objectives that we need to hit um, on that note in terms of tasks versus uh, versus goals uh, Luke Gerstner, who's a former CEO of IBM and RGR Nabisco, he said, never mistake activity with results. Well, objectives are results, right? They have the key results baked in, right? OKRs, objectives, and key results. That's what you expect as an outcome at the end of the quarter, right? Activity is the tasks people do. A lot of managers at your company are talking too much about tasks. Let's do this task, let's do that task, let's do this other project. Okay, that's great. But what are we trying to achieve here? Are we on track with our objectives? And that's the key thing to keep in mind. So um, on that note, <coughs> just to wrap things up, um, so Robert talked about um, the you know strategy and one-page uh, strategic plan. Uh, if any of you are interested, you know, this webinar is, is obviously it was educational about strategy, setting strategy, um, using objectives to move your strategy along and connect it to execution. Uh, but if you're interested actually in our product, we do have a one-page strategic plan called TOPS, the one-page strategy. You know, your your mission and core purpose, your BHAG, this is actually our own for our company. You have 10 corporate values and in our product, you can actually... Um, give feedback to people and click on those corporate values that people at your company embody, right? And uh, which is really great. Then you can actually not only have your corporate values just on a piece of paper that nobody ever looks at again, or just on your website in the about section, but you can actually hand out uh, rewards and, 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 and recognize people for embodying and exemplifying these core values. That's when they start really meaning something. That's when the rubber uh, uh, meets the road. Your company's brand promise, how you're different, right? Um, things like your uh, core competency. What are your core advantages of your company? Your theme, your marketing strategy, your issues and risks to watch out for. <clears throat> the main idea here is really that um, you're uh, basically trying to think through and ruminate on how to be differentiated, how to execute your ability to get from where you are today to your vision 10 years out one quarter at a time with your quarterly okrs and then one year at a time with your annual okrs right and obviously you can really only set real-time objectives by the quarter in the year by the way i apologize about all the noise out here we have a huge team here in the office and i'm in the open space like andy grove was at intel by the way he didn't have a corner office <laughs> he was always out there with a the whole uh, team he had a cubicle uh, i believe in that and of course, uh, you know, if you're interested, again, you know, make goals measurable, make progress measurable, have statistics and data uh, to see uh, what's going on. And of course, on goal alignment, if you're interested in understanding how goals align, um, you know, how to set up alignments across your entire company, um, you know, and look at it from a goal perspective, not from an organizational hierarchy perspective. We'd love to show you that. Come to our website and sign up for a demo. Um, also, we're giving away this book. Uh, complete uh, getting started guide to enterprise OKR goal setting, uh, enterprise meaning business. And finally, one our other uh, free gift to you all, and I know Robert already gave you so many good things that um, everybody hopefully should be should be happy, especially, you know, get a brand new book that's coming out. I'm pretty excited about that. Um, but we're also offering a personalized 60-minute consultation uh, with Robert spearheading all the key insights on the strategy um, enhancing your strategy or coming up with your strategy. Robert is, is one of um, less than 300 globally uh, renowned and, and uh, certified gazelles strategy consultants in the world. Um, there's only a few of them out there, and he'll give you real insights, um, you know, get, get tips on strategic planning. We'll talk about OKRs and how to set up. We can even give you direct OKR examples for your own company if you wish. Um, pretty, you know, pretty real um coaching session it's not supposed to be uh, just some some flexed conversation but very real if you're interested email me and we'll set something up with robert and uh and i think on that note we have still four minutes left that we can give back to your day hopefully uh that was useful edifying and educational and, and robert thank you so much for being a guest of honor today that was really helpful and interesting yeah thank you zorian 
thanks everybody so much and, and have a great day. We hope to hear from you.